So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session. It's a great Friday. I hope uh, you're not too tired and that the prospect of a weekend is keeping you a bit excited, and we have a very exciting panel ahead of us. So today, um, in this session, we will be speaking on for investing in clean energy and just energy transition. Now, this session, um, this session will be addressing and, and looking at um, the energy sector and looking at how, of course, we know that today over 759 million people do not have access to electricity and 2.6 billion people do not also have access to clean protein. To address some of these issues, the GCF supports clean energy and just energy transition towards low emission and energy access and power generation um, for climate resilient development. As for our private sector strategy, we seek to address the adaptation aspects of climate projects and these are becoming increasingly important for the GCF. GCF also supports energy access and power generation projects that contribute to both mitigation and adaptation because we know that these are important and they all have interlinkages. It's not a once, um, it's not a very, uh, it's not either or, both of them are important. So in this session, our speakers will discuss the respective institutions experience in promoting energy transition. And they'll also give us how they see these energy transitions nexus with some of the adaptation aspects uh, of climate change. We'll also discuss uh, the role of de-risking and innovative financial approaches to mobilize finance at scale uh, for energy transition. We'll also hear from our, part, uh, from our panelists the, how they're addressing the issue of affordability of energy transition in developing countries. And, um, and, and also how they are implementing the learning from the implementation from GCF programs and projects so that, that have contributed to clean energy uh, and just energy transitions. So to just uh, kick us off, I would have the great honor to introduce some of the really great panelists that we have here. Uh, we have our very, very special guest here. Uh, that is Wale Shonibare, who's the director for energy financial transitions. Uh, policy and regulation from the African Development Bank, which is the premier institution on the African continent and has a great uh, track record in investments in the energy sector. Um, we also have with us Gil Carrier, who's a director, director of innovation and strategic partnerships for Ignite Power. Also doing some really interesting work and then you'll hear a bit more about what they are doing in this area. We also have Yeva in the United, who is the policy and partnerships manager from Campo Clean Energy. And lastly, but not least, we have Jiwoo Choi, who's the chief of strategic initiatives in Acumen. So I'm the moderator for this session, that is Lilian Macharia, and I'm the director of portfolio management at the Green Climate Fund. A few housekeeping rules for those on-site and remote participants. We invite you to please submit your comments and any questions through the WOVA app, app and uh, during the session. And without much ado, I'll now move on to the presentation and I'm inviting our first speaker, um, Wale Shunibare, please thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lillian, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, an honor to be here. Uh, thank you to the Green Climate Fund for uh, inviting us for this presentation. So this morning, I'm just going to give you some insight into what the bank is doing uh, in the area of energy transition and uh, also highlight some case studies from our work with the GCN. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the African Development Bank, African Development Bank is Africa's premier financial institution with an extensive Pan-African uh, footprint established in 1964 in 81, uh, 80, with 81 member countries 
uh, all the 54 African countries are members of the African Development Bank, AAA rated, extensive uh, portfolio, um, you know, $26 billion of outstanding loans, um, $209 billion of authorized capital, and, um, you know, very present across the continent. Uh, we have five regional hubs, but we're in about 34 countries uh, across the continent. In terms of um, Africa's energy deficit, we all know that it's been widening um, with a rapidly expanding population. And the continent was actually making very good progress until uh, COVID, you know, uh, around that time, we know we've had the figure 600 million people are still without access to electricity, but um, that figure was decreasing, but unfortunately since uh, around uh, 2020, uh, 2019, we've seen um, um, a, a slight increase again of people without access. But Africa's energy needs are urgent and growing with structural transformations projected to drive energy consumption. So if we look at some of the figures, we have uh, 2.1 billion people um, who will live in Africa in 20, uh, 2040 from 1.3 billion uh, in 2020. 59% of the population will live in urban areas by 2050. 43% increase in investment in manufacturing, 100% increase in electricity demand by 2040, 150% increase in energy production in order to reach universal access. So some of these figures are quite staggering and um, we all have an urgent task to try to um, accelerate the provision of universal access. So if we look at uh, what we need to do, uh, by 2030, um, we need to have an eightfold increase in the amount of investment going into the power sector, mostly into low carbon generation. Um, we have seen that um, between 2015 and 2018, there was quite a, um, an accelerated pace of plus 24%, but that has flattened out a bit in recent years. And if we look at where the investment is going, a lot of the investment is going into, um, you know, grid-based, you know, still 88%, but um, the off-grid is improving, is increasing quite rapidly. So when we talk about the story of Africa's energy transition, we, we have to understand that um, each region has its own transition story. So North Africa is predominantly gas-based, 77% of, uh, of production, but there's a growing emphasis on um, utility-scale solar. Countries there are trying to decarbonize their grid. In East Africa, you have hydro as the main source, 65% of total production, but geothermal is, is quite strong in countries like Kenya and uh, Off-grid generation is also growing quite quickly in Southern Africa. Again, you have hydro, but we've, we've seen large discoveries of um, untapped gas assets. In Southern Africa, it's mainly coal, but the government is also trying to decarbonize the grid uh, and uh, fairly successful renewable energy program. In Central Africa, it's, it's also hydro-based. And in West Africa, it's uh, gas, with 49% of total production, and uh, Nigeria accounts for almost 50% of the total production. So Africa's energy transition story is not a one size fits all. Each, each region is going to adapt based, based on its own resources. For one thing that's worth, uh, one point that's worth making, you've all heard the figure that Africa has contributed around maybe 3% to global uh, emissions um, uh, on a cumulative basis. And so what I often say is, you know, if Africa were to switch off all its power plants today, the world they wouldn't, wouldn't even notice in terms of emissions because there's hardly any, um, 
you know, the, the, the emissions figure is very low for Africa. It's also worth pointing out that by contrast to other parts of, of the world where energy sector makes up about 75% of the emissions in Africa, um, energy sector is only about 40% and it's mostly agriculture and land use make up about 52% of, of the emissions. So in terms of the energy transition, um, Africa still has quite a way to go. Um, I often ask the question, if you have very little emissions, what are you transitioning from? Um, so that, that's a bit, but we know that Africa needs to grow very quickly and that growth should be through non-polluting technologies. So in terms of um, what's happening, um, we often try and encourage least cost uh, uh, electricity generation for countries to reach um, access by 2030. We can see that the mini grids have been growing quite significantly. And um, if you look at the rural areas, for many uh, countries, it doesn't make sense to try and extend the grid because if you, you know, in cost terms, it probably costs about $1,200 per, per connection to extend the grid. Where the load is is minimal, uh, it may be cheaper to 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 build a mini grid. We probably cost around five hundred dollars per connection, and the solar home system will cost about thirty five to fifty dollars per connection. So we can see from the statistics that um, the solar home systems and mini grids are also growing, uh, particularly in the rural areas in many parts of Africa. One thing to say about uh, variable renewable energy is the fact that you often have to enhance the grid. Um, the levelized cost of electricity is often not mentioned when we talk about getting renewable energy onto grids. And um, you know, certain countries, for instance, Kenya has seen that there's um, in increasing the amount of renewable um, variable renewable energy from 0.3% in 2013 to 14.6% in 2019. The system costs required an additional $50 million per year in order to stabilize the grid. So I think we have to come up with all the figures when we have these discussions. Um, it's good to see that uh, the cost of generation has declined significantly, for instance, for solar, between 2011 and 2019, you saw an 88% decrease in the cost per kilowatt hour. And um, for wind, about 35% decrease. So the, 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 the numbers are going the right way, but it's important to take account of all the costs and the uh, grid strengthening that we have to do in order to accommodate the renewable energy. In terms of climate finance, the numbers are still, um, not where we want them to be in in terms of the amount going in. Adaptation needs for Africa are estimated between 579 billion and um, uh, uh, be, between 2020 and 2030. So that's an annual figure of about 52.7 billion per annum. And also, um, we, we, we find that um, because Africa suffers disproportionate impact of uh, climate change, we're trying to put more money into adaptation. And so um, those in terms of the amount of climate uh, finance that Africa is able to attract is about um, 19 to $20 billion a year. And, and that's just not sufficient. The private sector is bringing in about 13% of the amount of uh, climate finance coming into Africa. We need to drive those figures up. So what are the things that we have to do in order to achieve the 1.5 uh, degree uh, pathway uh, while reaching universal access? Obviously we want to get more renewable energy of, of, onto grids. We want to balance the load across the fragile grids in Africa. We want to encourage more last mile connectivity and we want to encourage more clean cooking because as we know, um, uh, polluting fuels such as wood and kerosene continue to dominate households cooking practices. So um, what's the bank been doing? 
um, over the past 20 or so years, we have invested over $20 billion in the energy sector. 20% of that is private uh, to support the private sector and 80% is to support the public sector. And we offer a suite of solutions, you know, financial solutions, lending instruments, guarantees, equity participation. We also have some special initiatives. So we have the Desert to Power uh, program. We have the um, uh, Great Green Wall Initiative, which is to deploy nature-based solutions to prevent desertification. We also have the Africa Energy Marketplace uh, Initiative. Um, we do a lot of capacity building with the uh, uh, NDC hubs and also have uh, the Clean Dev Special Fund for Africa. So um, we have a trust fund called the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa. This is a very, very useful instrument. We've boosted the amount of money in that trust fund to about $300 million now and uh, supported over 56 projects in 30 countries. Um, and that fund is very flexible because we can use it for technical assistance as a concessionary uh, um, uh, loan window. We do reimbursable grants. We also do equity uh, investments with it. There are three key pillars of CEFA. There's the uh, green mini grids, what we call green base loads in order to be able to bring more renewable energy onto grids and stabilize grids. And then there's the energy efficiency pillar. And one very good example of what we've done with CEPA was in Gabon, where we supported the 34 megawatts Kingele uh, hydroelectric project. And uh, that one had $9 million from CEPA alongside 20 million from the bank uh, and other partners. So um, one thing the bank has also done a lot of is to invest in um, equ equity funds. So the first renewable energy fund in Africa uh, was a bank investment. Um, then we have Evolution, uh, Inspired Evolution, Climate Investor One, and Arch. Okay, I'm almost running out of time. Okay, so um, just to give you some examples of what we've done with the with the Green Climate Fund, um, there's the leveraging energy access finance framework. Uh, which is to uh, do risk projects to encourage more local currency financing. There's the Desert to Power program, again, um, for G5 Sahel countries, grid investments, uh, utility scale IPPs. And then there's a, a project in, in DRC, which is DRC mini grids uh, uh, program to establish mini grids in, in towns across, um, three towns across DRC. Anyway, I've run out of time. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we're going to invite Gail. I think we we really appreciate the insights from the African Development Bank and we'll take questions in the next round. But uh, right now, Gail, please. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for having me, thank you for being here. Thank you for putting all the information that now I can build on, because this was the, great the greatest introduction I could ask for. Oh, okay. Hey everybody, my name is Gil, I'm leading the Innovation and Strategic Partnerships Department at Ignite Power, and before we deep dive into who we are and what we do, I just wanna say that a few years ago when we designed this proposal, this project proposal, we proposed to have what we call the Ignite 555 project. We call it that way because we wanted to use the capital in order to establish a very smart guarantees mechanism that will enable us to attract a minimum of 450 million US dollars of private capital into the sector. And by that, we achieve the 555 impact, which stands for 5 million deployments of, deployments of solar home systems in five different countries within a five year time frame. Now, a lot of things happened since then. Once again, it was like in 2018, the world went upside down. But one of, the, one of the greatest news that I can share today is that we now went back to the calculation and in today's reality, in today's sector, we can do twice the impact with the same amount of budget and with the same time frame. And I will show you exactly how in a second. Let me just start with a bit of a deep dive into the off-grid solar sector. We today see, for the last couple of years, we see 
a huge shift into the uh, standalone off-grid solar systems in sub-Saharan Africa, which enables us to deploy very quickly, very affordably, and solutions that are much, much better fit for Africa's last mile community, as I was just explained just a few minutes ago. With those projects, we put ourselves the goal to build and to develop the best and the most advanced operation platform for last mile communities in sub-Saharan Africa to execute large-scale electrification projects through standalone solar systems. So we don't manufacture the systems. We are the last mile operational platform that enables us to very quickly and very smartly operate in every location across Africa. Just a few numbers about what we did so far. So we connected a bit more than 1.5 million people to electricity in four different countries. Today, we sell 10,000 villages. We trained more than 3,500 agents. Most of them are based in last mile communities. One third of them, by the way, are women. And we saved more than 120,000 uh, tons of greenhouse gas emissions. One thing that is very unique about our operations is that we believe that technology is a core value for the sector. You know, this sector may sound very operational, and most times when I talk about uh, innovation, people think that we innovate by building better systems, which we are not. We, once again, we don't manufacture. We put a lot of emphasis on building the best software and digital tools for last mile monitoring and management. So today we have fully digital operations, even in places with no uh, cellular connectivity. We have very advanced data analytics, we have very advanced platforms, communicate with our customers and with our agents and so on and so on. And those technologies and this time data analytics enables us to be much more affordable than anyone else in the sector. And with affordability, which is another core value for Ignite, we always prefer to be the most affordable provider in each, in each market. This affordability enables us accessibility. What we see is that every 10 cents that we take, uh, that we can take the price down, we are seeing thousands and tens of thousands of families that are now able to acquire the solar home systems. Affordability and accessibility, of course, equal the bankability and the PPPs that we sign with governments and with banks. And together with the locality, it all equals to the impact, both from the environmental point of view, so saving, uh, replacing the use of, of combustible fuels and uh, replacing the, the need for very polluting solutions in the future and from the social point of view. Hmm? I'm missing a slide, but it's okay. And another important thing that uh, was happening in the last couple of years is what uh, what is called the, the RBF trend. So we see a huge movement from traditional project financing into RBF, which stands for resource-based financing. And resource-based financing, basically what it did, it shifted the risk from the customer's payment, payment, once again, we are doing standalone systems. It means that we deploy the system on the customer house. So we are dealing with hundreds of thousands and millions of customers that pays us a monthly fee every, fee, every, sorry, every month. So what RBF did, now we get a deployment fee from financiers such as the World Banks and others, which are AAA rated. And that basically shifted the risk from the customer payment, which was unfortunately far away from AAA, to the AAA rating that we have today. This is the first half of the equation. And now when we went back to the project design that we proposed several years ago, and we did the calculation over again, we now see that we can do, and this is a very, uh, uh, let's say a, a very conservative approach. We can now do a minimum of double the impact at the same time frame and the same budget. So if we talked about 5 million deployments, now we're talking about 10 million deployments of solar systems, connecting more than 50 million people to electricity for the very first time. How am I with time? Okay. And why is it important? As it was just mentioned just a few minutes ago, Africa is going, Africa's population is going to double and is going to be, in 20 years, it's going to be 25% of the world population. Those people will be electrified. We cannot let anything, it's the only option. So option one, keeping living without access to electricity is just not an option. We need to have people electrified everywhere. The second option is to keep having the same polluting and grid-based solutions that we know from pretty much everywhere else in the world. And if we won't do anything about it today, Africa in the future, in 20, 30, 50 years from now, will become a major polluter in the global scale. And the third option, is to deploy the insights that we gained over the last couple of, of decades from other sectors around the world, from the US, from Europe, from, from South Korea, from Asia, and to deploy a better sector. 
And by having an off-grid based sector, we can be much more efficient, much more sustainable, and also much more affordable, and of course, much cleaner for the entire world. I will just say just a word about that. Um, on top of replacing the use of combustible fuels and on top of replacing the need for having a very polluting energy sector, we can create a major social impact uh, across the continent. This is, those are just some numbers from a, an inner research that we did to assess our impact across several last mile communities across Africa. I think we can talk about it a bit later, but as you can see, having electricity taking it, people that used to live without access to electricity now have even the smaller size of solar home systems. So we are not talking about nothing fancy, no TVs, no fridges, not even fans, but even just the small size of system, just having home lightning, radio, and a phone charger creates massive impact on, in a continental scale. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Gil. I think that's an interesting perspective on some of the off-grid solutions that are also reaching them last mile. So now we're asking Yeva, if you can come and share some experience. Morning, everyone. So my name is Yeva. I work with Camco Clean Energy, and I'm very excited to be presenting some of our work to you this morning. So for those of you who haven't heard about Camco, Camco is a climate and impact fund manager. We design and manage specific um, facilities that are tailored uh, to be able to address climate challenges. Uh, Camco has been around for over 30 years. Um, we are based on the ground in most of the markets where we are working. Uh, I myself am based in Nairobi, and you can see that the core focus is um, on the Africa market and, um, and on the Pacific region. We became an accredited entity to the Green Climate Fund in 2020. We are an international private sector accredited entity and very excited to be working with the GCF. So to answer the question, how CAMCO supports clean and just energy transition, um, we do that by, as I said, designing specific financing facilities to bring capital to address the challenges that we are facing today. Currently, we are working on three financing facilities. The first two are already operational. That's the Renewable Energy Performance Platform, or REP. Um, the facility has been operating since 2015 and until today has been financed by UK government. Uh, through REP, we have financed, we have made 46 investments in 16 countries in Africa. REP can finance uh, small IPPs, so decentralized small-scale renewables, um, small IPPs, mini grids. Uh, we have been quite a pioneer in that space with, I think, um, over 10 investments. Um, as well as solar home systems companies. Spark is much more recent. Um, it was designed by Camco to address the needs of the commercial and industrial market. Um, so we can finance commercial and industrial renewables and energy efficiency, currently in five markets um, in Africa. And the third one that we are hoping to launch next year will be focusing on the Pacific region and financing renewables in the Pacific. And this is called TIDES. So, what I was asked to talk about, of course, the focus of the session is how to deliver both clean and just energy transition. And I think I wanted to perhaps expand the conversation beyond what um, is, I guess, the adaptation, the resilience of communities reaching the last mile, which my colleagues have already talked about and, and will talk about, is particularly important. But I wanted to stress some other dimensions, and that is um, that the big, bright, and beautiful, so focus on the large-scale projects, is not always the most impactful. I think, um, as has been mentioned, with the private sector strategy of the GCF, we are increasingly focusing on the adaptation benefits of renewables as well. And there, the distributed renewables really come into perspective. Why? I will highlight through several points, which I think are worth mentioning. So first of all, distributed renewables, and when I talk about distributed, what I mean is small-scale IPPs. So as I said, through REP, we can finance projects of, well, small and medium scale, but it's up to 25 megawatts, with a small exception for wind power, um, as well as mini grids, isolated grids, so metro grids, as some, some call them, um, as well as the commercial and industrial, so captive solar installations. 
when we talk about small IPPs, and I know that there are many, you know, I don't want to um, sort of under stress the importance of the challenge that we have, the mitigation challenge that we have. And of course, the large scale projects are very important. But I think as Wale mentioned, the African grid, for example, will need a lot of strengthening to be able to take on the amount of renewables that we're hoping it will. And so what distributed renewables can bring to this picture, if we're talking about small IPPs, for example, is really the strengthening of that network by either injecting locally into the national grid or by injecting into a decentralized grid. So the resilience of infrastructure here comes really into play. The second aspect is of course that through renewables today, we can really reduce the cost um, through replacement of diesel. And here, I guess the captive solar really comes into play and I'll highlight some examples of what impact that really can have on, small, uh, on SMEs in developing markets. Thirdly, through focusing on smaller scale, we are able to address the needs and bring into the picture more local developers. So really facilitating knowledge transfer and focus on companies that can deliver solutions for the markets where they are working in. When we look at large scale IPPs, many local developers are perhaps just not ready to develop that, that scale of a project. So through designing facilities that target more smaller decentralized renewables, we're able to um, work with more of the local developers. And finally, of course, so creation of jobs, whether it is through project development, whether it is by providing saving costs for SMEs through captive solar, or by distributing connections for the first people for the first time and enabling them to perhaps expand into various productive uses and diversify their incomes, hence increasing climate resilience. So I think what really highlights um, our impact is of course the case studies. So I'd like to focus on several case studies from the work of um, Campo with REP and Spark facilities to really highlight the both mitigation and adaptation impacts. And so this is a project that is quite uh, dear to us. It's, uh, it's a financing for a hybridization of HFO, so heavy fuel oil plants in Madagascar. When we talk about distributed, this is probably one of the best examples. It was the project that had HFO plants in three different locations connected to local grids. Um, so again, it's really the financing that we provided is also tailored to the, to the local context, which is you know, where the grid is today in, in Madagascar. We provided a bridge loan to finance the first phase of hybridization of these plants through solar power to a total capacity of 5.7 megawatts hoping that this will be a pilot project. Um, it's not so much of a pilot given the scale, but uh, really a demonstration project for many more uh, HFO hybridization investments that can be made in, in Madagascar, including with um, the developer that we worked with here, Lidera, who is hoping to scale this up to 30 megawatts. And of course, the project is highly aligned with the government's agenda, both the climate and the president's um, emergence initiative for Madagascar, which is really looking at hybridization both from the perspective of strengthening resilience of infrastructure, reducing the costs, hence supporting economic development, and of course, improving the energy security of the country. The second project is also particularly exciting. Uh, in this case, it was a developer called Rift Valley Energy, which is very well established in Tanzania, who came to us for financing for a scale up of the project that was already on the ground. So at the time, they were already running a run of river um, generation plant, as well as managing a local distribution network through a franchise. So they were injecting the um, hydro capacity, both into the local network and directly supporting some of the larger scale um, tea factories and other productive users, as well as many small scale um, businesses and, uh, and consumers, customers, um, while also feeding into the national grid. And what happened is that because of the success of uptake of productive use, the generation capacity was just becoming not enough. Of course, the second factor that had an impact on the situation was climate change and the increasing variability of rainfall, which had um, significant effect on the availability of hydropower, particularly during the dry season. So what they decided is to hybridize this generation, this production through an installation of a small wind, um, wind farm, which became Tanzania's first wind farm. And that was supported through the REP facility. 
as I already mentioned, of course, the hybridization strengthens the climate resilience of this um, infrastructure, ensuring that the productive users and individual customers are getting power that is insured to them and high quality and, um, and running all the time. As well as being the company being able to expand their network, deliver more connections to both individual private customers as well as uh, productive users. Switching to Spark, um, two examples quickly from the work of Spark. Um, so the Spark facility, as I mentioned, has been designed to finance the CNI, commercial and industrial renewables and energy efficiency. And I think this is particularly important to mention as well, which will be highlighted in the second example. The innovation here comes at the facility level. So we really designed Spark to be able to, take, uh, to address the needs of local companies. Spark really prioritizes and works with local companies, local SMEs in this space, who we call development partners. The way that the facility is designed is that we, let's say, go through a due diligence of a development partner. And once we sign a partnership agreement, Spark is able to finance a pipeline of their projects. So we guarantee that we can provide up to 100% of construction capital for their projects, which really saves their time um, and effort and is enabling them to really scale up, go out into the field and find more projects. And so this is really the solution that we've designed to finance these small scale projects. Many of the CNI projects you can see on the African continent today are really at least several times larger. Um, this Sitima printers and stationers project, which is um, a site that's close to, to, the, to Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, is a 90 kilowatt peak solar rooftop project installed by our partner Safi Power. As you can see, it reduced the cost by 30% and improved, of course, security resilience. And as I said, it's Spark supporting the developer SME, which is in turn supporting the other SME. The second example is a Brookhouse school in Kenya where we installed um, both the solar installation, but also a range of um, energy efficiency measures. And again, I would say that that's the ideal approach where we first focus on energy efficiency. And then after the energy efficiency measures are um, in place, then we scale solar appropriately, hence delivering the most um, returns um, and impact at the lowest cost. And so to sum up, what I wanted to say is that the way that, you know, how, how does Campo do it? How do we fund more distributed renewables and how do we ensure that through financing renewables, we also deliver multiple adaptation benefits? Of course, it's by designing smart and innovative financing solutions, both at the facility level and at the project or so investment level. It's by developing a strong local network of delivery partners. And as already spoken a little bit through Spark's examples, it's through standardization and important capacity building. While working with local companies, we do need to be quite patient a lot of the time. And, um, and really the ability to help them in their journey is very important. And I think maybe just one thing to highlight is what was mentioned already by one of the speakers, I believe from the Deutsche Bank yesterday, which is that when we talk about private sector and some of the programs that we're designing, the grant element is always really quite controversial. But even a small grant funding, if we are able to deploy that um, in the form of capacity building together with our investment, can go a long way in, in delivering these additional adaptation benefits. Enabling environment is of course something that we can, that is particularly important as well, but I won't expand on that today. So thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Eva, for your uh, presentation and insights on um, off-grid solutions. Uh, now we invite Jiwu to speak to us on the last mile in Hadis to reach. Thank you, Lillian. Good morning, everybody. And then it is such a privilege to be back to TCF and speak about the Sardis Reach initiative um, that we actually are seeking to work together with GCF. So um, my name is Chiu Choi. I'm um, Chief of Strategic Initiatives, leading the Hardest Reach initiative um, in Acumen. Acumen has been a pioneer um, in off-grid solar energy space in Africa. 
Since 2007, we invested in 40 companies that together brought clean and affordable energy access to 135 million people. That actually represents more than 30% of the individuals who have gained off-grid energy access since 2007. And um, so it has been about $100 million investment from Acumen, which actually catalyzed $775 million follow-on capital into our portfolio companies. I believe for the last 15 years, we've seen a needle has moved. And it was possible because a few of our social entrepreneurs, they took a bold step towards solving a big problems like climate change, poverty, universal energy access. And then more players build on the knowledge and build on the business models that they created. So um, I actually would like to share with you today the Acumen's journey in this space since 2007. So um, as you can see in this chart, Acumen started 21 years ago with the big idea of patient capital. And today I will only talk about the energy, but um, Acumen is very active in agriculture, education, healthcare as well. But um, we have many other colleagues who can talk about energy, like agriculture and like healthcare. So if that that's all um, climate resilient that we are doing these days. So we probably have another opportunity to talk about it, but today I'll focus on the energy. So um, it, like after six years in 2007, Two co heads um, came to our office with the idea of solar light, with a vision to eradicate kerosene, which was actually used by 1.5 billion people um, as a source of energy. But kerosene, if you think about it, it's expensive, it's dangerous, it's polluting. And um, we took a bet, we say we took a bet because it was a very noble idea at that time. And we invested in this idea. And the patient capital, it took about 10 years for um, allowing these companies to try and fail and try again and listening to the customers, learning the market until they have real business model. So when um, this, this company, is about $50 million revenue. Acumen has invested across this emerging ecosystem. And at that point of time, we actually assume that impact investor will come in the space and um, help these companies to scale up. But the truth was, there were not many. There, there were not many who wants to take the risk, even at this point of, time at this level where the business, business model were proven and then these companies were actually becoming profitable. So at that point of time, we decided to create for-profit impact investment funds called Kawisafi Fund. It was in 2016. And then I have to tell you, without the GCF, Green Climate Fund support being an anchor investor for um, Kavisafi funds, that would not happen. That would not have happened on time in the right, um, right kind of capital. And so with $40 million um, like philanthropy capital and $70 million for-profit impact investment capital, we reached, again, 135 million people that we are very proud of. Sorry. Yes. So um, <laughs> this actually gives us a confidence to say 
All right, we have only, not only, but we have 800 million people left who doesn't have the electricity now. So what do we do? So that was our next question. And then that's the story behind this hardest to reach um, approach that we are actually, um, we, we, are, we, we, are, um, we are working together. So actually the, um, the critiques for the investment community as a sector for me, that's my own view, is that just too much of, too much of the capital goes to um, where the capital and returns are already proven, not to where the capital is desperately or most needed. So after this um, 15 years investment, after this 15 years of investment, what we found is these investments are quite concentrated in a few countries, Kenya, Rwanda, and um, like Senegal and few others. So like we, we have to replicate, we don't have to reinvent the wheel now. We can replicate this success model into um, 22 other countries where the electrification ratio at most is 45%. So then how should we structure or how should we design this hardest to reach um, facilities? So we condensed 15 years of um, Acumen's, um, Acumen's experiences, experiences and learning into it. Philanthropic capital is actually needed to create markets that doesn't exist. So that's the starting point of this facility. So we put, take, put together um, a $50 million grant facility to, to create the market. And already we raised, thankfully, um, $22.5 million um, billion for it. And then what we are trying to do is, actually we have already started investing into it, is we um, incubate locally owned and managed companies who has potential to grow. And at the same time, we support um, the companies who have already proven their track record in other markets to expand into these countries by setting up a joint venture together with us. So once they, they prove their products in, in these new markets, and once they're ready to scale up, we have $200 million debt funds in place to provide a capital for growth. So if you if if you think about it, this is um, this this financing is meant to cover a um, a uh, a growth cycle from the very beginning until the companies become mature. So it will be like ten to fifteen years of financing. Then um, there's but still you know SDG seven. It's only eight years left. And can we do any better? Can we do better than what we have done in the past? So we are actually um, launching, launching a exciting initiative together with like-minded players. So we are forming an alliance with World Bank um, and Power Africa and a few other um, players to actually go together. And we call this rich partnership. So Acumen will actually support the companies to roll out the products into the new market where the market doesn't exist. But like if we, we can go together with World Bank, who's a government partner, who can actually support, you know, the governments to, to, to have right policies, right regulations, and then provides end user subsidy to narrow the um, affordability gap, the, the impact that we can create would be much more than we, we thought we, we could do. So this is another initiative that we are actually working really hard on. And then American, sorry, African Development Bank, Ignite Power, Chemco, you are all welcome to join us. So I think as if we can join forces together and if we go together for the same goal, I think we can make a huge difference. I'll stop here and then I look forward to um, having more discussions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jill, and also thank you very much, uh, esteemed panelists. So we will now go on to the question, and I see we have 
two questions from Hoover. Um, also the colleagues who are in the room, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise up your hands and you can also take note and give you the opportunity to, to respond to the questions. So in the interim, as we allow the people in the room to ask questions, I'll go to the first question, which comes from Emmanuel Feliciano. Um, and at this one, I'll be posing to Gail and Yeva, if you could give us your perspectives. The question is, how do you encourage the private sector to invest in distributed renewables and mini grades? Since you've been in that space uh, from the private sector angle, maybe you can give what, what you have found to be working. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great, great first question. Uh, actually, this is for sure one of the greatest challenges of the sector. And like uh, my colleagues, we are 100% working with the customer. So we don't develop big projects that we can inject the electricity to the grid. We work on a standalone basis, providing enough electricity for the household level, which means that our operations are based um, in many cases on the customer's payments. And as I said, our core focus is only on deep rural hard storage communities. We don't do urban, we don't do semi-urban. We only work in a last mile deep rural communities. And as such, many investors really want to invest, they, uh, they can see the impact both the social and the environmental. They see the potential for the financial investment because those projects are highly profitable for investments for investors. And they see everything that I just mentioned before about our technologies and about the company. And yet they're, they're scared because deep rural Africa is far away. It's uh, uh, very challenging to, for them to monitor or even to visit. And there is always this big fear of the customer's ability to pay in those communities. And for that, there are two things that are really disruptive. The first one is the RBF, the Resource-Based Financing Programs, and that financiers such as the World Bank is now providing, which is per se, it's a deployment fee for every successful deployment. Now, if we know and we feel very comfortable with our ability to deploy and with our ability to verify, because we have all this digital verification platform and operations, so we know for a fact that we have this deployment fee coming from an organization such as the World Bank, which is a AAA. Um, so this is the first step of de-risking the operation. The second is, is, is this is the, the proposed the, um, the project that he proposed, the Ignite 555. By having more smart guarantees mechanism, we are able to de-risk the operations for more investors. There are so many investors investors out there that are that really want to go into the sector. We, every time we host one of them that even come, just come to see our, our offices in the, in the capital city, not even going to the deep wall communities, their eyes are open and they just want to get on, they just went in. And the more uh, guarantees facilities we have, the more reliable and credible uh, partners such as Acumen, such as Camco, such as the World Bank joining and providing those guarantees facilities, we will be able to attract more capital into the sector. And I, I believe, and I think that this is something that we see for the last couple of years, every successful investment brings free more investors to the sector. And this, this is exactly what companies like us and others need to do now and in the next couple of years. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Eva? Thanks. I think Gail has uh, highlighted some of the key points. I mean, the key word here is de-risking, um, and, and that can come both at the sort of facility level as well as project level. So at the facility like REP or Spark, what Camco and Acumen are doing are really creating blended finance approaches. So by deploying, by attracting some of the more concessional capital, we are able to lower the risk um, and attract um, more commercial capital as well. And this is how we mobilize financing. At the same time, we need to, when we are designing these facilities, we need to design them so that um, they support more of the firsts. So REP has been really created to um, come into perhaps a slightly um, riskier markets and you know be the first one the first mover often um, and together with that bring in others as well so it's about demonstration it's probably about demystifying the market because in the end in the financial space risk is a perception and as long as we speak more about it as well um, and demonstrate more successful projects uh, that is what leads to um, a, you know a more acceptable environment for a broader range of uh, investors and and they can increasingly come in. 
Okay, many thanks, uh, Yeva. But before I come back to Ali for the second question, I don't know if Jiwa, you want to speak to the question again, which was about how you get private sector interested in renewable energy, especially given you the, the fact that you highlighted what Acumen has done in terms of the renewables. Thank you. Um, so before joining GCF and um, Acumen and um, this impact space, I was in finance, conventional finance, structural finance, project finance, corporate finance, and you know, and then those investment, um, like investment bank, insurance companies, they have fiduciary duties. So it's not like um, they don't want to invest in the space. They have fiduciary duties to comply with. So then if you want to channel those mainstream capital into developing countries, climate finance, we have, we have to, we have to figure out how we can work together. So I think that's where GCF can be very critical to make that happen. I believe GCF is, has very unique proposition to be a bridge between mainstream finance institutions and climate projects in the developing countries. Because G GCF has very like wide range of um, de-risking products from guarantee, from full source capital, equity, concessional loan, grants, repayable grants, you name it. So GCF can be very flex. I <laughs> Lillian, I'm sorry, I'm like <laughs> I'm 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 talking as if I'm you, but um, but I just want to emphasize GCF and a credit entity like Chemco and Acumen and Africa Development Bank can do much more than we have been doing together with um, the mainstream financial institutions. Very many thanks, uh, Jiwoo, for that pitch, even for GCF as well. But um, I want to come back to Wale, but I also want to remind colleagues on the floor that you still have an opportunity to ask questions. So if you do have a question, please feel free to raise up your hand. We have uh, roaming mics around. So feel free to, oh yes, there's a question coming up. And then we get to Wale. Thank you. I'm John Song from Green Transformation Lab. Um, this question goes to the most brave panelist on the stage. Um, according to the UN Environment Programs report, in terms of carbon emission quantity, um, we need to reduce about 25 to 28 gigatons of carbon dioxide or GHG beyond all the collective NDC commitments in the world. So we need a very dramatically big achievement in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I would like to gain insight from the panelists about how we can fill up this ambitious achievement of filling up the gap, uh, what uh, would be the best strategies to scale up all the impact through from all those climate actions? Either it can it be a one big mega project at the global level, or will it be uh, the resonating replication of small, simple projects or investments? I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Very many thanks for that question. Um, just to make sure that I got it correctly, if I'm not wrong, I think the question is that there's such a huge gap in terms of what we need to do to reduce emissions. And therefore, how can we um, come up? How do we bridge that gap, you know, either through a big project or small projects? And I think that question then can go to everybody. So I'll start with Wale. From the big picture, you're a big institution with huge footprint and significant capital. What do you see as the potential? And maybe you can speak also from your FDB experience. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Lillian. I just wanted to go to the initial question about how you can de-risk um, off-grid uh, energy projects. I think it's worth highlighting the role of local currency capital which is absolutely key because many of these projects um, 
are paid for by the you know lower socioeconomic groups in local currency and we see a lot of hard currency financing in these projects and for long-term sustainability you have to find a way to crowd in local currency finance which is something that the african development bank has spent quite a bit of time doing so for instance um we have uh, we created the Nigeria Infrastructure. Well, we invested in the Nigeria Infrastructure Debt Fund, which for the first time you're able to get long-term um, loans in Naira. This is a listed fund that is listed in local currency, and also there's a, a, a the Leveraging Energy Access Framework that uh, is supported by GCF, where we're able to guarantee local banks who are investing in the sector. The other thing for long-term sustainability is, is around productive use equipment, because in some of these uh, localities, you don't have a lot of load. And in order to be able to encourage that, we also have schemes in which we use to encourage productive use uh, to, to actually get some long-term uh, um, demand on the grid. So if you have communities where they're involved in milling or fisheries, and you're able to provide that equipment that that also uh, supports in addition to the performance based payments and the uh, minimum subsidy grants that um, ourselves and the World Bank provide to support these projects. Now, in terms of what we can do to scale up, we're all aware of uh, what's been happening in the in the COP discussions, COP26, COP27. You have to provide market signals and um, you know, there's a lot of discussion in Europe about the, um, you know, the, the, the carbon adjustment tax, you know, CBAN, carbon border adjustment tax, because you, you have to address the, the countries that are generating most of the pollu pollution, and you have to send market signals that will encourage them to move into more uh, non-polluting uh, fuels. Um, in, in poorer countries, because they the emissions are much lower. Obviously, you want to encourage growth in a more sustainable way because we can't all follow the same path to development. But it's very critical that at the same time that you're looking at what you can do, like we were saying in Africa, there's a lot of emphasis on mitigation in, in an environment where there's very little pollution uh, compared to world standards. You know, so we should find ways of crowding money into adaptation, but the mitigation um, issue has to be addressed in the countries that are generating most of the pollution. And that's the way we're going to meet the 1.5% uh, um, target. Thank you. Thanks, um, Gil? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, I think this is the most question that can be asked in the room. Um, the, there are two aspects. First of all, the one thing that we, it's not something that we can do, it's something that's, that we must do today, is to change the paradigm in Africa. Africa, for me, it's the most interesting place in the world because it's potential to leapfrog. You know, I still call my parents to their stationary form, at home, and Africa's population, the rural population will never do that. They don't know what it is. They will just call the cell phone. And we need to do the same with the electricity, electricity sector. We need to leapfrog the uh, very not efficient and not sustainable grids that we have today, that we know today, into an off-grid model that I believe Africa can pioneer, and then we'll see the same model in other places around the world, not just for small size systems, but also for bigger systems. It's a much more efficient model and a much more sustainable one. And once again, if we want to do it today, in five years from now, we will see grid-based and very polluting solutions. And in 10 years from now, this question won't be, won't be what can we do to mitigate or to adapt? But the question will be, will be, what can we do to reduce the emission coming from Africa? And this is something that we cannot afford to have. Um, and more specifically about your questions, I'm a very big believer in small and medium-sized solutions projects, not one huge one. Huge projects tend to be to take a lot of time um, and to be uh, much more harder to, to deploy and to execute. And more importantly, I think that having all the effort that I just mentioned, it's not something that we need to do from a philanthropy perspective. It has a lot of social value. It has an enormous uh, environmental value, but we need it to be something that investors and businesses want to do because it's a good business in the end of the day. And if we will be able to create an environment, a business environment that will make it 
a wealth go to uh, for business entities and business companies and other investors that see the the added potential and the added impact but not going just for the impact that will be the way to to take this environment and this market to the next level and to really avoid this horrifying situation of Africa being based on a very polluting electricity sector just as we know today thank you Gil. Eva, do you want to come in? Thanks. First of all, I think I just wanted to say that I really agree with what Walea mentioned by bring, when we talk about mitigation, by bringing attention to the developed countries where most of this action has to happen. I think adding to what the two speakers have already said, um, my contribution would be to focus on a change in, in mindsets. I think this is where the transformational change will come. As um, Mr. Yanni Glamarek said at the opening of this conference yesterday, Currently, the climate-related investments and climate-related projects are still seen as high risk and low reward. And we really need to, through demonstration, I think is probably the key word, but also all the other aspects we talked about, try to shift this mindset towards climate investments being seen as, in fact, lower risk in the current um, situation where the, where the globe finds itself, lower risk and higher impact. And I think once we have this shift, then, then really the scale um, will come from there. Thank you, uh, Yeva. Jewel? Yes. Um, thank you. I just would like to add um, a one point about the lack of data, because I think in order for us to narrow the financing gap, we need a private sector like the mainstream financing, um, finance, financial institution come into the sector. But the issue for them is, as we all um, talked about, is the risk is too high. And then the risk here is perceived risk. It's because there's no data to calculate the risk in the sector. So that's why like Acumen, Chemco, Africa Development Bank, we are take, we take forced mover risk as we discussed, and that actually builds the data for private sector to follow. And then if we do it more, and if we have the audacity to go to the place where no market does no market exists yet I think that will bring the door that will open the door uh, for the private sector to come in more so I think there are role for each of us to play here very many thanks you um colleagues if you still have any more questions please please feel free but I, in the interim I have another question that I'd like to direct to Wale um the question from Wuba says in Sri Lanka 100% and majority of the generation is owned by a government, and thus it's a monopoly. This has made it extremely difficult for private sector to enter the energy market and have severely hampered transition to renewable energy. How were similar issues resolved in other regions? What advice can you give Sri Lanka to overcome this massive, its massive I guess, obstacles on it, in its path to 70% renewable energy by 2030. Okay, uh, thanks, Linnea. For us, I think what, what we, we try and do is we take a holistic approach when we look at the energy sector. The sector has to work. The sector has to be liquid. So you have your distribution companies, they collect money from their customers, and that money has to flow through the system to the generation companies. So you, you have you know, your transmission um, uh, as well as your generation. What tends to happen when many um, countries liberalize is that they liberalize at the generation end, but if you're not collecting enough money, you're not able to pay the IPPs. So whether the, the, the companies are privately owned or publicly owned, you find that it's important that the system has to work. The value chain has to work. You often find there's a lot of subsidies because politicians like to provide subsidies for the energy sector so they get reelected. And sometimes those subsidies are not sustainable. If the system works, then you're able to attract investment from the private sector and and also the government is able to invest more so what we try and do is provide 
support to allow utilities to function. In Africa, unfortunately, most of the utilities are not uh, really making a profit. Many of them, in fact, are technically bankrupt. So it makes it very difficult for them to contract with the private sector, often renewable IPP developers, and each of these private sector developers wants their own government guarantee. Of, but guess what? Governments have a limited ability to provide these guarantees, and many of them, especially post-COVID, are reaching their debt sustainability limits so they can no longer provide the guarantee. So what do you do? The other thing you do is we have to move away from the single buyer model. That's why we're putting a lot of money into regional power pools because you don't want to be able to sell to only one utility that may not have the, the, the credit worthiness to buy your power or for you to achieve bankability. So if you build regional interconnections, and you empower the power pools, then you can have power trades. So today, Mozambique is selling power to South Africa. It's selling power to uh, you know Zambia and and uh, Zimbabwe because the Southern Africa power pool is probably the the best developed in Africa. It's not perfect, but there's trading that goes on. We need to replicate that, and that can also work for Sri Lanka and other places. It works to us. Uh, reasonably works reasonably well in Europe, where um, there's a lot a lot of trade, and it allows you to bring more renewable energy onto the grid. So the UK can buy nuclear power from France, um, and it has its own offshore wind generation that it sells into the system. As we know, the wind doesn't always blow. So when the wind isn't blowing, it's it's able to get baseload electricity from other countries. So these kind of holistic system approach is what's going to allow you to get more renewables on the grid and and for the for the sector to be to work and be sustainable long term. Thank you. Very many thanks, uh, Wale. I don't know if there's any other panelists who wants to come in on that question. If not, maybe I have a. I'll still ask colleagues on the floor if you have any questions, please feel free to raise up your hands. But I do have a follow-up question as colleagues, um, the, the audience probably feels free to ask additional questions. But while I just wanted to ask, uh, Sri Lanka we know is having currently a debt issue. So if you're talking about moving from a single distribution, which seems to be the case right now, um, and you're talking about getting to the, get independent producers or that would also mean there's a credit worthy aspect. So how do and it's an island. So how do you deal with that? Sorry, how do you deal with how do that deal with the fact that there's still a credit worthy issue that you've mentioned that and it's yes. currently, if you're looking, I guess from what it sounds like, it's mm -hmm. it's already a monopoly. So you don't have options right now ready yes. to off to for off taking or being um, mm -hmm. independent producers yeah. generation. How do you address that? I guess the question is how do you transition? to get into the way private sector can invest in generation, but also mm -hmm. there's an uptick on the grid. Yeah. Well, this is very difficult. Reforming utilities, reforming distribution companies is very difficult because it's very politically sensitive, but it has to be done. So you find many utilities have bloated, uh, you know, they have a bloated cost base. So you have to look at their staffing, you have to look at their production. Many yeah. times in some countries, such as in Zambia, we've had to um, uh, support a cost of service survey to be done because the different uh, sec sector stakeholders could not agree on the true cost of production. So you will have you know, uh, mining companies who get subsidized electricity. They don't want their, their, their tariffs to go up and they are saying they don't want to subsidize the inefficiencies of the utility. So you need an independent party to come in and say, look, based on my analysis of the costs in the sector, this is what the tariff should be. Through technical assistance, we're able to support these kind of activities. And we're also able to engage in policy dialogue with the government to say, look, these are the areas that require reform in order to um, um, improve your utilities. One thing you find is many of these utilities take on short-term debt. Sometimes you're able to come in and refinance that debt and stretch out the tenors, make it longer term to improve the cash flows of the utility. 
So this is, you know, hard work that you do with the governments looking at um, the entire value chain to see where the weaknesses are. In one country, for instance, you found there was a lot of gas-based uh, production. So the, the generation companies were paying in hard currency for the gas, but they were selling their electricity in local currency and the government wasn't making the adjustment to allow for depreciation in the currency. So that's partly regulation, which you have to put in place. So there's not just one answer. There's a whole series of uh, solutions that you can bring to bear in order to in, in, improve the liquidity in the sector. Many thanks. So, well, I think we need a class on this uh, masterclass in energy systems. Um, but another question I want like 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 to pose to the entire panel as I wait to see if the audience in the house would like to ask any other, any more questions. Um, is is one that. I think Wale referred to, and I want to hear from your own very perspective, different perspective, how you see yourself contributing to this dilemma. You know, um, when you're talking about solar energy, there are concerns that, you know, there's not enough that will be generated through this renewable energy most of the times to meet the base required by developing countries to achieve their economic and industrialization ambitions. So how do you see the complementarity between what you, your institutions are doing with, you know, with those kind of ambitions and what maybe the, the mainstream, more heavier duty investments um, projects are bringing to the table? And how do you see this? Because I think what you've also heard is from most of the developing countries, especially if you're looking at countries, uh, you know, continents like Africa, that, that contribution to the actual pollution is limited. But they, there will be a lot more demand coming up. And I think then the opportunity there lies in, as Gil said, the program. Question is, what are the complementarities that you see between what you're doing and making sure that you contribute to both the twin objectives of you know, low emission, but also adequate economic growth and industrialization? Yeah. Um, yeah, great, great question. And this is something that we hear a lot. Um, as I said, because we are very much focused on deep rural and hardest to risk communities, our number one goal is always affordability. And although we have a very large scale of systems from the smallest one to the biggest one that can uh, provide enough electricity to fridges and fans and TVs, a huge chunk of our customers are the one living in the hardest to risk communities. And in order for the system to be affordable enough for them to have, it needs to be the small size system small size system in a, provide enough electricity for home lighting, for a radio and for a phone charger. And this is something that, uh, that really we, see, we hear a lot. That is it enough electricity to create this development change that we want to see in those communities? And the answer is absolutely yes, for several reason, reasons. First of all, uh, and this is something that we do a lot of impact analysis and a lot of uh, reporting. We uh, visit our customers, we collect tons of data, as I said, we have those surveys, we have those apps that we can communicate with our customers. So we, we are able to, to collect huge amounts of data and then to analyze them and to see not just the financial information, but also the impact information about everything we do. So first of all, we see a very big uh, increase in the children grades. Children who have electricity can now study, can do homework after dark, and we see them getting better grades, better education. Better education is the agent number one for any kind of economic development. Second, we see huge savings. Customers who have solar home systems tend to, 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 to spend a, a minimum of 15% less a month, both for energy consumption, because they don't need to pay for kerosene and for candles and so on, but also because they don't need to go to the kiosk to charge their phone, so they won't buy the extra beer or Coca-Cola they buy every single day. And third, and maybe the one, the one that I found most, in, most interesting, we see a very big economic development, so increase in revenues for the household after having small size solar system. And when I saw the data and I saw that it was like people saying that they, they are now doing 20 to 50% more revenues for the household just for having the small size system. And I didn't understand why. So we sent teams to meet those customers to do a bit of more uh, quality analysis. And what we saw is that the majority of our customers, of course, are farmers. And before having the system, they used to work until 3 p.m., then go home so they'll have enough time to cook, to be with their children, and go home because it's dark. 
Now, only by having light in the home, I'm not even talking about the phone charger or the radio, the radio. just by having lights, they are now working until 5 p.m., then go home, and then sort the yield together with the entire family, with the kids, with the, fam- with the wife. It becomes like a family activity they can do after, after dark. So they have more yield, better income, and this is angel number one for economic development in rural communities. Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, Wale, do you want to speak again to that on the bigger picture? And then we go to Yeva, who will tell us about the localized distribution aspects. Um, okay, so our perspective is that um, there's room for different technologies. And to respond to what Gil was saying, I don't like when people use the word leapfrogging, you know, with all due respect, because no country is ever industrialized from renewables. And when we look at the country that has moved fastest in terms of reducing emissions is actually the United States. Maybe over the past 10, 15 years, they've been able to reduce their emissions from energy generation by over 30% from coal to gas switching because gas has become very cheap in the US and gas is less polluting than coal. So we've always taken the view that Africa has its natural endowments. Africa needs to develop and there's significant gas resources in Africa. And there's a role for gas to play in Africa's energy transition. There's a very strong role for gas to play. And there's investments going into gas. And it's quite encouraging to see that, um, you know, following what's happened in in Europe and the energy crisis, uh, the, the EU, has also modified their language in terms of the role of gas. You know, so we have, all have to be very realistic. Like I said earlier on, if you switch off all the power plants in Africa, the world would not notice. So it's very important that as Africa is moving towards cleaner energies, that the developed world also do their share in reducing quite dramatically. We have in Europe today countries that are restarting coal plants because of the energy crisis. So the, that, that debate has to be put firmly on, on the table. And Africa, like I said in my presentation, there are different um, characteristics. If you look at the regions, they have different natural endowments. East Africa is, is almost 90, over 90% renewables because you have significant geothermal and hydro resources and, and so we have to use those endowments to make sure that Africa can industrialize and create jobs as quickly as possible. Because if you don't create jobs, people are going to be burning, using firewood and burning down forests and destroying your carbon sink that the world needs in order to, to, to hit its net zero commitments. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Wale. I think so what I'm hearing, and I'm trying to imagine that you, when talking about renewables, it's more or less like solar because you also have hydro, which supports the base load. I'm just curious about when you talk about renewables, what the difference, whether there's any distinction between when you're talking about things like hydro, which, as you say, if you're looking at Central and East Africa, are part of providing the base load versus when you're just talking about things like off-grid, um, lower, you know, Wait. Just for by way of clarification, I was talking about variable renewable energy, which is mainly solar and wind. Thank you. So, Yeva, will come over to you? Thanks. Maybe just to add quickly to what uh, Wale was saying. I mean, when we talk about endowment in resources, many developing countries, let's say we're talking about the African continent, are very much endowed in renewables that are also not sufficiently tapped into today. And that includes, of course, hydro, that includes geothermal power. We have countries really trying to lead in the space, for example, with Kenya, Namibia, South Africa, trying to step into the green hydrogen space. Um, So there's there's really a lot of potential, I think, to talk across the different technologies, including renewables for for this um, just transition. But uh, in in the you know in the space where I was talking about um, about examples from Spark, so com- CNI, commercial and industrial or captive solar, you know the example that I provided it's a it's a thirty percent reduction of costs already for for a business that was reliant on a combination of grid supplied and diesel um, based generation as a as a backup. We have a really huge um, untapped potential 
of replacing this diesel generation and reducing the costs, in fact, already through the, you know, through the kind of technologies that we have today that are renewable technologies that are very much cost effective. And they're able to support these local small businesses in, in fact, reducing their costs and being able to deploy this capital to grow their activities. So I think this, we, we have to stress also how far the renewables market has come in the past decade or so in, in reducing the cost of it. And then that is really, you know, of course, it's it depends on, on every country and the situation where it is in, the resources that they have. But overall, of course, the cost competitiveness of renewables should always come first in this argument, in my view. Very many thanks. Jiwood, if you want to add to that and maybe also broaden the, the discussion to some of the other investments beyond Africa, because I think we're also looking at other audiences from different areas and see where you see the complementarity between renewable or low as in, you know, low emission pathways that we contribute to and, and, and the ambitions that developing countries have. I believe there's like a lot of opportunities across different um, types of technology. And so that's, but um, I just have to come back to um, the last mile um, energy access because we, we are talking a lot about economic development through utility scale um, renewable energy projects, but we are actually forgetting those 800 billion people who just don't have the access to the energy. And then why that matter is Africa is growing so rapidly. If we don't provide clean energy access, it will replicate the, the, the mistake that we made in developed countries. So I, 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 I believe that's actually a um, critical point. And um, actually giving the first time energy access to the people on the ground that actually builds the demand for the more solar energy, more renewable energy, and that that actually will be um, help the economic development and then economic resilience for this company, this this um these people too. So it's like there there's a criticism um about like small like solar home system. What does what does that do for the economic development of like Africa? But I believe. That's the first point that we have to go because once you have the access to the electricity, clean, affordable electricity, that actually help people to move up the energy ladder. That means they will start from small lighting, mobile charging, TV, radio, uh, refrigerator. Now we have off-grid um, off solar refrigerator that is being quite prevalent in the, in the region. And then we see a lot of solar irrigation system, which actually help the agriculture to combat the climate change. So I just have to come back um, where I was coming from. <laughs> Very many thanks, uh, Jill. We have, I know we are running out of time, but we have a very quick question from um, Wova, which I'll just ask if, I may probably just ask one of the panelists, panelists to really uh, speak to. Um, we are told that, what, that one of the questions is asking, when tying up with other countries, read as suggested, and I guess that goes to Wale, because you're talking about the South African power pool. People or government have the fear of being at the mercy of other governments for their power or being used for political leverage. How did African countries overcome this when the hub was formed? And have any such issues arisen? And if so, how were they resolved? That's the assumption here is that South African power pool is functioning. But I think the question then is, we, we already know what we're witnessing around energy um, in, in Europe. And the question is, a lot of countries have worries, are apprehensive about that. So the question is, how, how do you overcome that potential challenge? If, and if it has happened in the power pool you referred to, how was it overcome? Okay, well, um, there's a lot of talk about you know, energy security and um, countries want to have their own uh, production facilities, but there are also many countries who have got comfortable with 
the fact that they're buying power from neighbors. So Botswana, uh, Namibia, they buy most of their energy from South Africa. They don't have um, enough local generation capacity to, to uh, meet their needs. And they don't feel that they need to because sometimes you find that it's just cheaper. It's just plain economics. So, for instance, if you look at the landlocked countries in the Sahel, the, the Mali, Burkina Faso, many of them rely on fossils, uh, on, on uh, sorry, HF4 or, or diesel production, which is very expensive. But some of them are now able to buy uh, from Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire has gas generation, which is cheaper. And so the economics is driving this regional trade because if they don't have those uh, endowments or resources to allow them to generate uh, cheap electricity, they find that they have to buy from a neighboring country. And um, you find that many of these countries have very weak grids as well. So you can't just build a solar uh, a plant there because the grid doesn't have sufficient base load to anchor the solar. So. Countries are practical and they go for the most practical solutions. So very many thanks, Wale. I know we've ran out of time. So I think we all agree that if we're to continue, just generate another energy from here. So uh, please put your hands together and thank the panelists for us. I think they've done a great job. Yeah. As indicated, we've heard a lot both from about the fact that the energy, you know, um, demand is growing with the population and there's also a huge deficit which needs to be addressed and that cannot just be addressed by you know um, the main grids which also has to go to address localized and go, and also consider both um, adaptation aspects and implications and this if you're talking about just transition we have to also look at how what the impact of energy access has towards um, the you know the local production and economic activities um, I think we've been told about the different financing mechanisms, the different solutions, technological, financial, policy, and regulatory, as we've heard from our different colleagues, and we've seen some of the examples. So I think we've we've come out of here a lot more, uh, you know, more knowledgeable, and I think we have the panel in front of us to thank. Please, please feel free to reach out to them after this, because I think we, there's a lot more to unearth, but we couldn't get to. Thank you very much for your audience. <laughs>